Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Comic Con 2013. I love you too. Yeah, just just him. Um, so uh, today we have a we have a fairly full panel uh, with a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, a little people are still streaming in, but uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, definitely, we're staying through the Q and A today for a reason that will become clear near the end. Um, and uh, and we do have a packed panel for you today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. Um, and uh, I'm also going to turn on this PowerPoint clicker, which terrifies me. So. There we go. I'm good with technology. Luckily, I'm not doing the tech demo today. So, um, The panel today is called Halo Inside the Looking Glass, and that's obviously an allusion to the fact that we, are, we have a product coming out on Microsoft Surface and Windows Mobile Phones. Uh, and so glass has been a big part of our, our year this year. Uh, but it's also called Inside the Looking Glass because we want to give you a little bit of a look into the development of uh, Halo Spartan Assault in particular. And uh, we'll have a couple of other little announcements here today as well. So our panelists are myself, I'm Frank O'Connor, I'm the Franchise Development Director at 343 Industries. Uh, my job is to stand up here once a year and then insult people during the Q&A and then get yelled at by the nice people back at the office for how mean I was. Um, this is Dan Ayoub, he's our executive producer on Halo Spartan Assault and he also yeah. He, he also runs our, our publishing division, which is the, the division at 343 Industries that, uh, that handles all our sort of uh, extra stuff, uh, as well as the main game itself, then obviously published Halo 4, uh, but also publishes other stuff like Halo Spartan Assault. Um, and to his left is Martin Durand from our, uh, our partner Vanguard. G Woo! And, and these are the, uh, the geniuses uh, behind the, the tech and the art and the, the implementation of Halo Spartan Assault. And we're very excited to have him uh, all the way over from Europe today. Uh, and uh, to his left is uh, Graham, Graham Ballbag Jennings, the uh, senior producer at 343 Industries. And he works on Halo Spartan Assault. Uh, and his middle name is very famous in our studio. Um, and to his left, we have uh, Nick McWhorter from Dark Horse Comics. And he's going to be talking to us about our our new partnership with Dark Horse Comics, and this is Comic-Con, uh, something we're very excited about. And to his left, uh, which is stage left? Is it right or left? I don't know. Like, yeah, to, to his actual left is Brian Reed, a franchise writer at 343 Industries. He worked on the story for Halo 4. He's worked on the story for Halo Spartan Assault. And he's also uh, going to be talking a little bit about the comic project that we have with, with Dark Horse today. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to turn over to the, the much handsomer and more charismatic Dan Ayoub, and he's going to talk a little bit about Halo Spartan Assault. Thanks. Hello? Hello? Yeah. No? There we yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. First of all, thanks, everyone, for coming. Excited here. Day one of Comic-Con. Uh, you guys having fun yet? <laughs> I am looking forward to getting out there after this panel, so I hope to see some of you guys out there. So, uh, yeah, just you know, a couple of quick words about Spartan Assault. So, um, for those of you who might not know what the game is, at a really high level, brand new way to play Halo. So, we wanted to do something really different since we were looking at mobile, uh, mobile platforms. Uh, easiest way to think of it, top-down twin-stick action shooter. If you like Robotron, if you like Smash TV, um, you know, those types of games, those were kind of our inspiration as we were developing this. Uh, just very quick, fast-paced action, something you could just jump in and get going. But, you know, at the end of the day, whatever we do wants to stay connected. It still has to feel like Halo. So uh, we, while we were building this, the, the goal was really how do, we, how do we create the right experience for the right screen, right? Because obviously Halo, everybody knows that classic uh, first-person shooter experience staring down the, you know, the sight of your gun on your console. But this has never really been done on this kind of franchise uh, level for us on mobile. So it was really important for us to do the right game for the right screen. So we built it with touch in mind, and we wanted to make sure it was true to Halo. So the things you guys like about Halo, you know, the sandbox, uh, that's a very big part for us. So the ability to pick up any weapon through the course of the game, jack any vehicle, uh, obviously really awesome cinematics. Uh, we worked with the sequence guys, uh, sequence group up in Vancouver, who we worked with on uh, Halo Anniversary and Halo 4 as well, to actually get some cinematics into mobile devices, which is something, you know, you generally don't see as a rule. So we're really excited to be able to do that. So it's everything you'd expect from a Halo game um, in just a very different compartment, right? And we also wanted to make sure we were taking how people play mobile into account. 
this wasn't going to be something, you know, most people don't sit down and, and pound through a mobile game for, for seven hours in one shot. So we kind of broke it up into smaller chunks. So if you do want to play start to finish, you're probably looking at two, two and a half hours uh, to get through it. Um, but it's broken up into chapters, so you can get through it if you've got five minutes here, five minutes there, or something like that. Um, then the big challenge, of course, for mobile is always uh, controls, right? I mean, if anyone here has played any of the mobile games, that's sometimes where you get into trouble. Uh, if you're like me, your, hand, your fingers glide when you're trying to play and all that stuff. So one of the really cool things we did, uh, I think from a control standpoint, we'll talk a bit about this in a minute, is uh, just assume that that's going to happen and we created an adaptive uh, control system. So if you're, you're playing and your hands do glide, your controls actually move with you. So it's a really, really cool thing because you never lose control of your character. You're able to just keep going. It's, it's a whole lot of fun. Um, and finally, graphics, right? Sight and sound. People think of Halo. It's cutting edge graphics. It's great sound. We did 60 minutes of uh, original audio for this, uh, which has you know, never been heard before. Really, really fantastic. And the level of graphics, quite honestly, that we've been able to, to get done in the game is, is just extraordinary. Um, you know, when you think of mobile games, generally the first thing people think of are, are limitations. And we just wanted to change that paradigm and just say, like, man, what's possible on this? Can we really make a badass looking Halo game on these devices? And, uh, you know, we feel like we've really been able to do that. Um, I think we've just we've got a couple of shots of some of the environments here. You know, you can just see some, some very, very interesting environmental type pieces that we've created that are going to pop on these types of devices. And again, as I was saying earlier, everything we do ties back into the larger franchise, right? So there's a story connection back to the franchise and back to Halo 4, where this is actually taking place on a simulator on board the Infinity, where uh, Spartans can hone their skills and their downtime. And this is a way for them to reenact classic battles that the UNSC have fought and kind of take a different, uh, their own kind of spin on it. And in this case, they're going to be reliving some of the early missions for, uh, for Sarah Palmer. And you, Dan, you're talking about graphics. Um, it's, it's pretty much the same experience on Surface as it is on phone, right, in terms of how the, the fidelity looks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a great point. And one of the really, really cool things is obviously, you know, this will work on phone, this will work on your tablet, this will work on your PC. And what's really amazing is, the, you know, you, you see the videos, you see it on tablet, it looks as good on your phone and it looks as great, you know, on your, on your um, PC. So it's just a fantastic experience across the line. And the other thing we wanted to do was unify those experiences. So if you start playing on your PC, you can continue playing on your phone, you can continue playing on your tablet. Uh, so it just really turns into a really fun experience you can take with you with connection points back into your Halo 4 experience, which again, we'll get to in a second. Uh, but I do want to give you guys kind of a peek for people who might not have had a chance to see it yet. We do have some video um, that we can go to that'll just kind of give you a great example of um, the game in real time. So I'm going to try and talk. I'm going to try and uh, talk through this without talking over the sound effects here too much because uh, you know the, the game really does sound phenomenal as well. Uh, but this is just a great example. I love some of these levels because it just shows how much action we're able to get going on at the same time, right? So you can huck the grenade, you can jump in, you can uh, you know, grab, as I said, weapons from the battlefield, you can grab vehicles from the battlefield. You know, this is probably one of my personal favorites that, you know, for those of you who may remember the dual SMG, um, it's a tremendous amount of fun to just do that in the game, right? And just mow through a tremendous amount of opposition. Uh, you know, interesting point actually this brings is, is one of perspective. So I talked a little bit at the beginning is, you know, the challenge for us was how do we take Halo and make it work at this perspective? And, uh, you know, working with the guys at Vanguard, we actually came across uh, some pretty interesting ways to do this. And, you know, and I just love this one. It's just a great example of perspective. But uh, Martin, you, you remember as well as I do that process, right, of, uh, of moving the cameras around. You want to talk a little bit about that? One of the, um, uh, the good things we've heard so far in the game, for people who've been playing the game, is, is the fact that they say it feels like Halo. It captures the spirit of Halo, as, as Frank uh, uh, usually calls it. Um, the, the, the best comment we've been getting is people say, okay, it actually, when I'm playing this game, it feels like I'm playing the traditional Halo experience, but then just from a top-down perspective. And that may sound very trivial and very straightforward, but when we started the project, it wasn't that simple and straightforward. Um, because, as, as, as Dan just mentioned, the, the references to Robotron, um, I could have gone to the team and said, okay, guys, we're going to make a game that's probably going to be best described as Robotron meets Halo. But the question then becomes, which side of the skill are you going to end up on? Because if you're going to follow the Robotron paradigm, you're basically going to end up with a very fast-paced, 
unlimited ammo shooter where you're shooting thousands of enemies every single second, which is what Robotron is all about. And that's definitely something that doesn't really tie in with what Halo is all about, which is obviously limited ammo, picking up different weapons as you go along the battlefield. But if you move to the other side of the skill and say, okay, we're going to go for the Halo experience, but then just with a top-down perspective, the first question that we obviously ask ourselves is that going to be fun? Perhaps there's a reason why all these twin stick shooters out there follow the Robotron paradigm for 30 years, and perhaps this is not going to work. So the first thing that we want to get clear for ourselves is if this particular top-down perspective is going to work. And we actually used a very straightforward and simple trick for that. We went and played a lot of stuff in Halo Reach. We captured footage, and this is actually something you can do yourself as well. Um, and we captured the footage, and in, in the um, in theater mode, we played back the footage, and what we did with the camera, we just pulled it back all the way to the top at a slightly like, off angle of 80, 88, 87 degrees. And that gave us this exact perspective that we wanted for this game. And what we then saw was this little guy running around on the battlefield, shooting stuff. And whenever he was shooting anything, you could tell by the color of his bullets which weapon he was using, and the rate of fire told you which weapon it was. You could see the elites and grunts all scramble, seeking cover, and. Um, um, jackals trying to uh, circle you and that kind of stuff. And that's when we say, okay, this, this can definitely work. This can ac actually work as a perspective for the game. So the briefing for the team originally was really simple. Uh, after that uh, uh, process of research, we basically showed them the actual footage, the clips that we captured and said, okay, guys, this is what we're going to make. This is what it needs to be. With obviously the slight caveat that it needed to also work on touch devices, which was the next big thing that we needed to address. So yeah, that, you, that, you guys are, uh, we're talking about this uh, from a remote perspective, and, and I think people in the audience, the cool people in the audience use like recon and inverted, and there's everyone else as well, but they're, they're probably imagining how do I do this uh, with my thumbs, and what are, how do these controls, and how do the Halo specific controls, things like boarding and reloading, can, can you talk us through a couple of examples of how, how you actually do those slightly more complicated things on screen? Yeah, um, so the, the, um, uh, obviously movement was, was pretty straightforward. It's the, the left stick obviously controls movement, but the right stick uh, was pretty, uh, pretty difficult to nail initially because uh, A, uh, touch-based devices aren't as, um, um, how shall I say? Um, tactile. Yeah, tactile or even uh, uh, sensitive towards yep. what you want to do. And, and if you want to aim for somebody that's slightly uh, to the right of you, if your thumbs are a little bit too big, you t totally run into, into issues there. So we, we actually addressed this by adding some auto aim onto it. And we asked ourselves the question, is this blasphemy towards you know, Halo fans, um, which we are as well? So, and we answered it with no, because it actually feels really, really well. There's a slight auto aim uh, uh, correction that if you draw your thumb in the direction of the enemy you want to shoot, we help you a little bit by hitting your enemy. And it's all about shooting in the direction of, of wherever you want to shoot and make sure you, you manage your ammo in the correct, uh, correct was, way. And what was really fun about that, too, was, was just that process of tuning it, right? Because, I mean, we, we, we ended up getting to a place where it didn't feel artificial or anything like that. It was a tremendous amount of fun. But, yeah, it did lead to that control problem we were talking about where I think we probably went through a dozen different control variations, if not yeah. more, trying to get to the right one. Auto aim and the control of vehicles were definitely two of the ones that we had to reiterate time and time again. And we did it with all the play tests. I think we had six or seven play tests. Yeah, how many play tests did we end up with, Graham? I think it was probably about 12 in the end, to be <laughs> honest. But yeah, we had different editions, as Martin says, of controls. You know, One day we'd kind of nail the on foot and it felt good and it was solid. And then we'd go to the vehicles and you know one was cool and the ghost was great. And then we're like, yeah, for the wraith and back background we go again. So I think you know from a lot of games I've worked on, this has been the hardest kind of control challenge we've had. Yeah, I think the, the big thing is obviously that, that whole, uh, the, the transition from moving towards a physical joypad with physical constraints towards something that's on touch, and you just have to get adjusted to it. And I remember some of the first playtests where we actually designed the game for it to be really held as if you were holding a glass joypad. And I, I, and I ended up being one of the first playtests, and people just put the tablet down on the, on the table, and they Use started pointing their fingers <laughs> on the screen. And there were a few people in our studio who did that as well, who I won't that, call out. <laughs> That's obviously people having gotten used to the fact that uh, you just point at whatever you want to shoot uh, with your index finger, which is uh, not how we wanted this to play out. And, and we really need, needed to set the barrier high for ourselves with the, uh, the touch controls. I remember doing the pitch to you and, and saying, okay, well, we want to do for 
for uh, twin stick shooters on touch devices, what Halo did for console shooters, and that is redefined control method. And uh, I think we've come a long, long way. I know it sounded really ambitious and a little bit arrogant, but I think the playtests have shown that people are really, really liking it. So and I'm really I, proud I of that. Do you think you were drunk when you said that too? And you know, <laughs> quite honestly, it didn't end up working out. And yeah, I mean, and Frank just brought up the great point. For those of you not familiar with playtests, this isn't like a couple of people. We have like. You know, huge swarms of people come through to play it, and yeah, it was really interesting because we, when we would think we nailed it, and then people would just come in and break it within a couple of seconds. Um, it was a pretty, pretty interesting uh, process. Um, so, wanna... so we talked a little bit about controls and obviously the graphics. Uh, I think uh, the Halo universe is built on story and narrative and characters that you guys are all very, very familiar with, and we wanted to do something. Uh, as Dan mentioned before, something pretty ambitious with story, certainly for a portable game. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna be uh, changing any paradigms in terms of our overall storytelling here. But we wanted to give this this product the respect and the the care and the attention that deserved as far as the story is concerned. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna briefly turn it over to Mr. Brian Reed, who can talk a little bit about that. Uh, we really wanted this to be something that could build off of the success we had last year with Spartan Ops in Halo 4. Uh, it was the first time for a lot of gamers that the universe became bigger than Master Chief and Cortana. Uh, and part of that was discovering that people actually really like uh, Sarah Palmer and our uh, Infinity shipboard AI, Roland, uh, hit really well. So when Dan came and said, we're doing this uh, Spartan Assault thing, who should it be about? We decided, let's get Sarah in there and let's have Roland kind of host the game for you. Uh, so it's all presented to you as if you're a Spartan on board Infinity and while you get to go play in the war games during the day, sometimes you've got some homework to do uh, and study your past battles and understand how other Spartans before you have done great things. Uh, luckily, in this case, you get to play it as a video game rather than go read a boring book or anything. Uh, so uh, Roland, uh, if we can bring his picture up. Uh, Roland hosts the game for you. Uh, it's a simulator on board the ship. Uh, he gives you some historical context on what's going on. Uh, what battle you're fighting, what the goals are to meet. And during that, you learn about Sarah Palmer's first mission as a Spartan Four in the field. So you want me to run the video? Yeah, I run a video, why so, not? So uh, we, as, as Brian and Dan have both mentioned, we work with Sequence Group in, in Canada on uh, cinematics for various projects. Uh, and this, this is uh, very much in their style of work with our universe. Uh, so we're just gonna run you a little clip uh, of at least some of it nobody's seen before today, so. Greetings, Spartan. I'm Roland, UNSC Infinity's AI. We're going to study the historical battles in hopes of increasing your tactical skills for the future. As a bonus, it's a pretty fun game you can play in your spare time. So let's get to it. Roland is very literal, very literal guy. <laughs> And uh, that's uh, all of our cutscenes throughout the game are done by Sequence Group up in Vancouver. Uh, and uh, they're the same guys that did uh, the Halo 4 terminals, all of the didact and librarian story for us. Uh, they did all of the terminals in Halo uh, Anniversary Edition, uh, all of uh, Guilty Sparks notes throughout the ages. And they are fantastic to work with as ever. Yeah, and so uh, speaking of story, it, it is, as I said at the start of the, the, the panel, it's Comic-Con. And uh, we've had a, we had a great relationship over the last 10 years or so with Marvel Comics. Um, but we, we realized that we, we, needed to be, uh, we needed to be working more closely with our partner. And so we, we started looking around. And we, to be perfectly honest, we kind of just turned left and looked at Dark Horse. Uh, we, we've got people who've worked with Dark Horse in the past uh, sitting at this very panel, a couple of Dark Horse guys on our staff. And uh, we knew that we were going to be able to get the kind of care and attention that we needed to really do the, the Halo comic series justice. Uh, and, and for some of the more patient among you, get them out uh, and on a regular cadence at a, a regular schedule. <laughs> um, but uh, some of the people still waiting for Uprising out there. But uh, so <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> not, not from not from this side of the fence, <laughs> but um, but uh, br so Brian's been working with the Dark Horse guy, and uh, and I just wanted to talk to Mr. McWhorter uh, for a second about the the new relationship. But we've we've announced it, but this is kind of our official coming out party, I suppose. 
Yeah, so uh, we're, we're extremely excited to work with 343 on the Halo franchise. Uh, it's just a, a, a universe that's rich and has endless possibilities for, uh, for storytelling. Uh, we think it, it fits quite well um, with a lot of our other ongoing science fiction series that we have, uh, things like Aliens and, and Star Wars, and, uh, uh, and something really important to us when we approach you know, working on our different uh, game properties is a uh, is story that's really meaningful to the player. Um, something that's going to really, you know, resonate uh, for people that have played uh, Halo 4, people that are going to be playing Spartan Assault, um, and to really uh, add to that experience and, and have storylines that, you know, bring a little, you, you know a little something extra about these characters when you, uh, you go in to play the game. And, uh, and of course, uh, be able to tell stories in between, you know, the various actual uh, games that are releasing. So. Um, the uh, initial series that we're working with uh, 343 on is, uh, is Halo Initiation. Um, and Initiation is a, a storyline about, uh, really about the, how the Spartan Fours uh, began and about, uh, about your introduction to, to Sarah Palmer when she was an ODST. Um, and then some of, uh, of really how she, the process of, of becoming um, this new generation of Spartans that, uh, that, that we're seeing in the universe now. Um, one thing that's really important to us in, in doing uh, any of the, the game properties or movie properties um, that we work on titles for uh, is really working directly with the creative people, uh, you know, behind the, behind the projects themselves. Um, you know, something we're doing now is working on the strain with, actually with Guillermo del Toro that wrote it. Um, and we've done that, we've worked with a lot of the writers and artists um, behind the games themselves uh, on the game properties we've done previously. Uh, and in this case, you know, we're working with, uh, directly with Brian Reed. You know, fortunately, uh, there's someone on staff who was, uh, in a former life, a professional comic writer, so uh, so that made things an easy transition to uh, to actually developing uh, developing the program that we're working on together. So um, I'll turn it over to, to you to talk a little more about you know the actual story of initiation. There's a there's a part of my job which is I'm always afraid somebody's going to find out that I do, which is called playing make believe all day. Uh, and uh, it's the kind of stuff I used to get in trouble for in grade school where it was like quit staring out the window and imagining things and now I get paid for it so that's awesome if it's, if it's work you can get, take it. Uh, and uh, the side effect of that is we come up with a whole lot of stories we don't actually have time for in the games. Uh, and we start talking about, you know, like, where did this character come from? Where did that character come from? What is the history of this battle and all that? And uh, when something like this comes along, we get to tell those cool stories. Uh, and a big example with this was the Spartan Fours, which are introduced in Halo 4, but you don't really get anything about them explained in the course of that game because that game doesn't have room for their story. That's a story about Master Chief and Cortana, not about the Fours. Uh, and this was our opportunity to say, okay, what makes a Spartan 4 different than a 3 or a 2? Uh, how do you become a Spartan 4? And in the past, we know Master Chief was abducted as a child and you know, trained up and became the, the Spartan that he is. But we wanted the 4s to be different. We wanted them to be people who were already successful in the military, who were given the opportunity to go be this bigger and greater thing and to become Spartans. And we decided if we were going to show that story, we should show the story of how their leader, Sarah Palmer, became a Spartan. And uh, that led into this awesome book that we're doing now. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then a little more uh, on the creative team. Um, so continuing with the theme of, of working with uh, the people behind the games themselves, the actual uh, cover art is done by um, John Liberto, who's a concept artist at 343. Um, and uh, the interior artist uh, is uh, Marco Castillo, um, who's worked on many different series for Marvel and DC, things like Green Arrow and Green Lantern. He's working with us on Star Wars Knight Errant currently, and, uh, and he worked with Brian as well um, on Invasion Frontline. Yeah, Secret Invasion Frontline, Marco, and I did a few years ago, so when it came up that he was one of the people that was available, I said yes, because <laughs> any time that you can write that much stuff and you can remember a moment that you got an email with a piece of penciled art in it that, you know, like, I write a scene, I imagine it a certain way, and when the art comes in and it blows me away and I can remember that years later, I want to work with that person again and again and again. So uh, the opportunity to work with Marco again was great. So, uh, since we have a kind of a captive audience that's here at Comic-Con, um, I, I wonder if I could like take a second to ask you to, how, Brian in particular, how did you actually get into writing comic books and what, what kind of advice could you give people in this audience who might be interested in doing that? I know there's no Hollywood upstairs college 
comic uh, books. The, uh, the joke that uh, Robert Kirkman told me once was every time he's asked that, he explains it as that uh, comic books and the film industry and TV and everything, uh, imagine it as a castle. And around that castle is a wall. And in that wall, there are holes. But every time you get through a hole, they plug it up. So giving advice on how to get here is totally useless uh, because that hole that you got through is gone. Uh, my two big recommendations are whatever you want to do, if it's art, if it's writing, do it. Do it every day. Morning, noon, and night, do it because it's the only thing you know how to do, and uh, eventually you'll make it. You'll get in uh, because you'll find that hole in the wall and you'll get through. Uh, for myself, it was dumb luck. Uh, I, I, had a game, uh, I had a game designer job and uh, came up an Ultimate Spider-Man game I said I wanted to write. And then they said, well, we'd really like Brian Michael Bendis to write it. And uh, then I got to write it with him, and then that turned into writing comics, and then that turned into writing Halo. So, <laughs> so dumb luck. That's my advice. Have dumb luck. <laughs> Anything to add to that? Like any job openings now for... <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to be announcing job openings? No, no, no. <laughs> I was hoping Dark Force would. <laughs> um, check our website. They're, they're up now and then. And there's a submission section, so don't come to our booth with it. <laughs> Frank O'Connor will be reviewing all of the portfolios. <laughs> And so, the, I mean, the, the, the slide in front of you is actually just a, a really simple example of the process that the art goes through. Uh, and, and actually, Brian, you can probably describe this better than I can. Yeah, so uh, there's one more square before this, which is all of my script, which is a big, boring jumble of words to look at that Marco comes along and has to make sense on the page. Uh, and so then he breaks it down into very loose pencils there on the left. And uh, since we get all 22 pages in these loose pencils, and Marco actually works a lot tighter than some people. Some people you will see squares and a stick figure standing there. Uh, and uh, we kind of go through and make notes, hey, maybe move this there, move that, the other thing. Uh, and then the, the second panel is inks over his pencils and really tightens it up. And then the third panel, of course, is full color. Uh, and then there would be one more panel to the right of that, which would be all of our lettering. And then we get it in and we read it and we're like, wow, this line of dialogue is terrible or this balloon is in the wrong place. And we move those around. And then when it's done, we ship it off to you guys. Excellent. And uh, we're going we're gonna to show you a preview of uh, one of the alternate covers that we have for this issue. And, and Nick can actually probably describe this better than I can too. So. Yeah, so this piece is done by uh, uh, Terry Dotson, uh, Terry and Rachel Dotson uh, together. Um, so this is a, a variant cover of issue number one of, of Halo Initiation. Um, Terry and Rachel, if people aren't familiar, have worked on many different titles at, uh, at both Marvel and DC, um, most well known for um, doing Spider-Man and uh, uh, as well as uh, so the Spider-Man Black Cat series with, uh, with Kevin Smith kind of when they were cutting their teeth, but uh, quite well known for cover art and interior art. Um, and uh, they're going to actually be signing at our booth at 2 o'clock today, so this will be a limited edition print uh, available at that signing as a cool, uh, a cool item to walk away with. Excellent. And so um, some of you know that I was born and raised in Scotland, uh, and I'm pretty Scottish, but I'm not as Scottish as Graham Jennings. Uh, and uh, Graham is going to talk to you a little bit about Halo 4 today, actually, because there's a couple of little announcements about Halo 4 that we want to talk through. And Graham has a much, 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 much better Scottish accent than I do. Mine, mine is long gone, and I can't even fake it, not even, not even after a couple of beers. I think mine's has kind of decreased a little bit over the time as well, but yeah, it's a little bit stronger than Frank's is. So when we look at like Halo overall, you know, we want to make sure the stories fit in and, you know, everything makes sense together. But as part of that, in terms of, you know, products, we want to make sure there's kind of cross between each product too, in terms of what you get and how things work. So for those who buy Spartan Assault, um, we feed into Halo 4. So you get some XP and an emblem uh, through this. Details for this will be released on Waypoint uh, shortly for that. Yeah, and uh, if you play Halo 4 and you complete the, uh, the campaign on nor normal or higher, you actually unlock some of the special weapons we have in, in Spartan Assault. If you complete it on Heroic or higher, you get some of the armor abilities. And if you actually complete it on Legendary, then you uh, get all the extras that are in the game available uh, for free. So as well, I'm sure those who follow the Halo 4 stuff see that there's a new map pack coming out uh, and pack over all the champions bundle. So we made sure there's a tie to that as well. So as you can see, there's, some, there's a new weapon skin um, and there's some stances and some other things you can get. So those who play uh, Spartan Assault and have the champions bundle get extra content on top as well to make sure that you know, we reward you nicely within our ecosystem. 
All right, well, uh, we, have a, we have kind of a PSA uh, to make, and this is really complicated, so I'm going to get, uh, there's a lot of stuff to go through here, and it's all pretty exciting. Um, I think uh, the, the first one is, oh, I went back. Yeah, so this is actually uh, Seattle fans. This is down the street from my house. This, this kid is there, the little Cortana's there the whole time. It's Gasworks Park. Um, so the, the, uh, the announcements today are fairly complex and I want you definitely to pay attention to this because it will be well worth your while. So I think uh, the, the first and most important and, uh, is the Xbox Lounge competition. So as you know, Comic Con's kind of spread out all over the place, but over the Hyatt, which is actually just across the street and to the right uh, as you head towards the water, uh, is the Manchester Hyatt uh, Regency Hotel. And in there is ballroom with the Xbox Lounge, which has loads of cool stuff. It has Xbox One stuff, it has uh, surfaces, it has Halo 4 stuff, and we're going to be having a booth tournament on Friday and Saturday night. Uh, at 5.30 through 8 o'clock. It's just a mini tournament. It's not connected to the, the Halo tournament that we're, we're having online right now. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a chance to try Ricochet, which is our new game mode, uh, as well as Team Slayer in, our, in uh, some of our new maps. Um, and it's going to be fun, and it's going to be fairly uh, casual and lighthearted. But there will be prizes. Uh, the people at the Windows Phone team have been very nice. And uh, the winning team each evening will uh, receive a Nokia Lumina, Lumia uh, 928 phone, uh, which I have, and it's a very, very nice phone. Uh, and you can, of course, play uh, Halo Spartan Assault on that. So if you guys have some free time and you want to play some video games, uh, you can head over to the, the Halo tournament over at the, the Hyatt Ballroom, and it's fairly easy to find, and it's fairly spacious. It's actually a nice place to chill out. Um, so uh, the, uh, the other thing I've got is that uh, later today during the Q&A, people are going to hand out cards that look like this. Uh, it's called Mega Card, and some of you already have them. Uh, this is uh, actually your ticket to a lot of very exciting and cool Halo stuff. Um, you would take that card to the same place I just described, the ballroom over at the Hyatt, uh, and you would trade it in for a lanyard, and that will come with a pin, an exclusive Halo pin. Um, and the... Uh, this is the card, right? Um, so the, uh, the pin is part of a big collection, uh, and it's kind of a little game that we have going on uh, at Comic-Con this year. You take your lanyard and your pin around the, the show floor to some of our partners, and you know we partner with Dark Horse and McFarlane and a bunch of other people, and there are over 10 exclusive collectible Comic-Con pins, all Spartan-themed. Uh, and, uh, and if you think of it like a game, if you think of it like a tchotchke, it doesn't matter, but it's a great way to collect some stuff while you're, while you're visiting the rest of the show. So I definitely encourage you to take the card that you get and take that over to the Hyatt and uh, trade it in for your lanyard, and then you can start collecting in earnest. Um, and uh, the first thousand people uh, to do that are also going to get an exclusive Mega Bloks Halo figure, which is the one you see pictured on the screen right now. So uh, the pins um, are really cool. Little... Uh, metal enamel pins and uh, again there's more than 10 uh, and there's some that aren't even pictured here and in fact that Halo Spartan Assault logo is also a pin. They're definitely worth collecting and definitely worth grabbing. So I think uh, and you'll get instructions on where the partners are and how you go about collecting the rest of those things. So that's a, that's a little announcement but uh, we uh, our very own Oprah Winfrey, uh, Dan Ayub, is going to talk to you about some of our other stuff. Uh, yeah, so just a um, couple of things to talk about today. So we talked a lot about the game, how it connects into your larger Halo 4 experience. Uh, what we didn't talk about is when this thing's coming. Um, it's a question we've been getting a lot. So uh, you guys are going to be the first to find out. It is launching today. Uh, the game is going to be live today at 4 p.m. You're going to be able to go get it. Thank you, and uh, yeah, you guys are the first to know about it. So 4 p.m. it's going to be out there. Uh, it is also going, it's playable, I believe, at the moment, right now, also over at the Hyatt. So you guys can over, go over and get your hands on it a little bit early, but uh, you're going to be able to grab it tonight. So uh, yeah, we're really, really excited to talk about that coming out today. I do have one other announcement for you guys. So you guys have probably seen a Surface, but you probably haven't seen a UNSC Surface. Uh, which, which I am holding here. Uh, pretty, pretty cool uh, piece of hardware, some very nice things. 
And some people in this room will walk out with one of these bad boys today. So I'm going to ask you to look under your seat and see... Wow, I wish Carefully. I had a camera going for that. <laughs> so you will find them. There should be uh, 25 under your seats. If you've got a golden ticket... Make them stand up. Uh, please stand on up and uh, come on up to the panel. Congratulations. Nice. Keep it orderly. And... <laughs> say you're going to win Surface Pro. Yeah. yeah. And you will win. You will walk out of here. You will win one of these Surface Pros. Just so come on, file up here to the front if you've got one. And no, you can't have mine. <laughs> nice. Congratulations. Jen, did you win? Nice. <laughs> Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations. And that means, uh, of course, the, uh, the people who win in the tournament will be able to play Halo Spartan Assault. Uh, and the people who obviously walk out of here was... And the Surface Pros, by the way, they're, they're not RT, so it comes with a touch-sensitive pen, the whole deal. So it's actually really cool. I'm very jealous, actually. Yeah, actually, we don't I'm going to check my seat. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Okay, so um, this is the, the traditional part of the, uh, the panel where we are going to turn it over to the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, so if you guys have questions about anything Halo, especially Spartan Assault and the other stuff we talked about today, but any Halo questions that you have, uh, now's the time and you guys usually know the drill. Hello. Um, this is a question directed towards, I think it'd be Frank and Dan, but I was going to ask about Halo 4's Forge, because I love Halo 4, but there's so many things about Forge that just, uh, they didn't really, like, it didn't, it wasn't as promising as it seemed. Like, you have the magnets option, which seems like it would work, but sometimes makes objects come together at a weird angle. The edit coordinate option doesn't really work all the time, and um, some things don't work. So I was wondering what happened with Forge. Why did you take out like little minor tweaking yeah. and zooming in? I mean, we we did make some we made some fairly radical changes to Forge, uh, including the lighting, which is it's not where we want it, but it's obviously much better. And so you're we were certainly starting to see the fruits of basically fans' labor. I mean, there's only so much we can do with the code. Ultimately, it's a, it's a tool for making art and making uh, experiences and worlds and sometimes objects, and, and the fans are doing beautiful stuff within it. And it is more flexible, and it is a little bit more powerful than it was in the past. Uh, it's something we, we took really seriously and will continue to take seriously in the future. So uh, I would just say think of it as a stepping stone and an improvement and an evolution, but that that's a process and that you know, the, the ultimate goal is to give players, fans, and creators something really, truly magical. And I think we're, we're starting to get there. Um, but, you know, the, the reality of uh, a game production schedule is that you literally can't do everything that you want. You know, you have about three years to make the game and you have all these other things pressing for resources and attention and, and stuff. And, you know, the, the whole Halo 4 process was a team coming together for the first time as well. So we're really proud of what, what we achieved, but there's, there's still a lot of learning going on as we learned who, who we were as a team and learn more about the code and about the game and the engine. And so I would just say, if, if, you, if you look at the things that we did achieve this time, uh, think about what that team now that's fully formed uh, and fully functional is going to be able to achieve in the future. So we're, we're excited about that path. Um, I was just wondering how the sale model for Spartan Assault is going to work. Is it just going to be through Microsoft online or will it be through like other vendors like Steam or other stuff? So uh, yeah, so as I said, the game goes live today. You're going to be able to get it uh, through the Microsoft store. So you know, if you've got your Pro, you can get it through that store. If you've got your phone through that, if you're going through PC through the, uh, through the Microsoft store. So that is going to be your primary way to get it, and uh, yeah, hopefully you jump on, jump in there, get in there, check it out, and uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it. Hi, um, I run the Xbox Twitter handle, and we asked our followers if they had any questions for the panel, <laughs> and overwhelmingly, we've had several folks ask, have you ever considered doing an open world Halo? <laughs> 
It's a premature round of applause. <laughs> um, um, I, as a person who gets lost very easily, I often think that Halo is an open world game, uh, but it tends to be me just going around in circles looking for ammo. Um, it, we've, we've considered it. I mean, we're not, we're not going to talk in any real detail about what the next Halo game looks like, uh, but it's, it, that would be a very different game than, than the existing Halo game, but it's, de it's definitely something that the, the team understands and is excited about, even at the, the smallest level, just about making our existing scale and scope more explorable and more replayable. So uh, not going to announce an open world Halo game at Comic-Con today, but I mean, it, it's definitely a thing that, that gets brought up time and time again, and, and one day it'd be, it'd be cool to maybe explore something like that, but not in the immediate future. Hello. Um, I'm a huge fan of Halo. I've been playing it for um, ever since I could hold a controller. But, so you're um, 40, 42 years old, right? 40, just, 48. I'm just staying 40, ESRB compliant on the but, podium. Um, and I noticed that in the uh, Halo Spartan Assault, they had the Wolverines in there. And I was wondering, is there any other vehicles or weapons that are being brought in that you can't play with in the... Uh, First-person shooters. Yeah, the Wolverines he, he's talking about are uh, some some people only play the Halo FPS, but Wolverines have been seen elsewhere in the fiction, also in Halo Wars, and they're one of many popular vehicles. Just to give some context. So. Yeah, so the vehicles you can uh, you can use in Spartan Assault are actually the Wraith, uh, the Ghost, um, and that's it. The Warthog. So Oh, of course. The, sorry, the, that's the uh, that's the uh, Covenant uh, vehicles, and then obviously the UNC vehicles are the Scorpion and the Warthog. Sorry, not the Warthog, the Scorpion and the Wolverine. And the Scorpion. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is curious to me. I'm wondering when he's going to snap on it. Yeah. Oh, it's a Scorpion. <laughs> right. <laughs> You, you can find out at 4 o'clock, <laughs> especially if you just want to service this program. Yeah, no, Martin's still on, uh, he's on, on, lo not time. on local time yet. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so you're going to be able to play uh, the Scorpion on the, uh, on the UNSC side. Now, one of the other things worth uh, talking about that we have is, obviously, we're looking at this as a traditional mobile launch. Uh, things aren't really going to end with us for launch, so you should uh, keep checking things out um, because you're going to see a lot of additional content starting to come down the line. Including vehicles and other objects from the Halo universe, which is... <laughs> Hello, I'm Brian. Um, it's very nice to see you guys. I'm... Oh, God, I'm so, I'm so nervous. Sorry. <laughs> Good to see you too, Brian. <laughs> oh, God. Just, you guys made Halo. All right, so I wanted to personally ask all of you, which is your personal Halo... Um, the favorite Halo game. Personally for me, I love Halo 3. Oh my god, I'm so nervous. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll start. Uh, for me, it's, uh, I, I do love Halo 4, but I, I think a lot of people in this room, they're, they're, they are going to have the same feeling, that, that feeling when you pop out of the Bumblebee escape pod in Halo 1, and you're, you're, it's, it's not so much the, the game necessarily, because sometimes I'll go back and I think, oh, I wish I had dual wielding, or I wish I had, you know, the, the new DMR, and you always start feeling like the things that are missing for it. So to me, it's like a continuum of games, but my favorite moment is, is still that moment when you tumble out of the Bumblebee and you look up in the sky and you see the halo sort of vanishing off into the distance. And that's not an unusual moment to, to hear described when you ask that question. So that's my favorite moment. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of my, my favorite one, yeah, like Frank, obviously four very near and dear to my heart. Um, I do have to say the one that really, because just on a personal level, and you, some people probably heard me say this before, I was a big uh, mouse and keyboard gamer until uh, the first Halo kind of came in and changed things for me. So, um, yeah, that's really got the closest one in my heart because that just really changed uh, my thought on gaming and just blew my mind away uh, at a very early time. I'd have to say Combat Evolved as well. I think uh, it's probably one of the very first games I played where I actually enjoyed dying because I could go back into the battle that I'd just been shot at and experience the same battle in a straight, a straight completely different situation. The sandbox feel was just uh, fantastic. So, Halo 1 for me. I think these guys have stolen my thunder a little bit because I have the same answer as them, but I, I remember seeing the videos before it came out and they were like, hey, this is on Xbox. And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, this is some video that someone's knocked up, a, you know, in a studio somewhere. And then it came out and I was like, it really is like that. And then, you know, you played it and it was awesome and it just went on from there. So, yeah, I'm Halo 1 as well. I really want to have a different answer here, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd have to say the same. I mean, Halo, Halo the first Halo game really changed uh, what shooters were to me. Um, I, I think, I guess I'll say my favorite moment when I was doing Halo 1 was uh, when you first get in the Warthog and you're playing co-op with a friend 
and uh, your friend can get up in the turret and you both get to go. I mean, I, there was just nothing like it uh, in games at the time. So, uh, so yeah, so I'd, I'd have to go with one just for those, uh, those kinds of moments. My favorite was the moment when a friend of mine pointed out to me in Halo 1 that you could pile up a bunch of grenades underneath a warthog and flip it in the air about 500 feet. <laughs> And I think we spent about 36 hours without going to sleep doing exactly that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, I'd just like to say uh, thank you guys for creating and expanding on a universe that we can all indulge in. Um, my question is, um, are you guys thinking about adding any uh, um, Xbox One arcade version um, to Halo Assault? Um, oh, I see. I see a question. Um, so we, we, right now, it's it's a mobile experience designed for for Windows Phone and, and Surface, but that doesn't rule out a, the potential for a future version. And I think that the important thing to remember is this game was designed from the get go for touch controls. So if we ever if we ever put on a something that used a different control method, uh, we we would have to pretty seriously rethink some of it. So there, there, you wouldn't have a straight port, for example. Uh, but it's definitely something we've thought about, and we'll continue to think about it as we go forward. All right, that last multiplayer update was pretty cool. I liked it a lot. Um, thank you for that. Okay, Guardian, you guys should bring back Guardian definitely. And yep. I want people to fear me, like when I play. <laughs> I wanted them to be able to see my CSR on the screen. Yeah. Um, can you guys bring that and like do that into Halo 4 at all? Like. So, so first off, I agree. We should bring back Guardian. It's uh, my favorite map from Halo 3. And uh, I'm, a, I'm not a good Halo player, but there's some maps I'm good at. Does that make sense to people? Like, there's just some maps you do better at, yeah. So, like, I'm good at Haven, I'm good at Guardian, I'm good at Lockout. So I, I absolutely agree, but for purely selfish reasons to do with my failure to, to adapt to any other kind of terrain. Um, and as for, uh, what was the second part of your question again? You said? The CSR? Yeah, CSR. Uh, yeah, I want CSR. To be able to see that. Um, so the, the, the way CSR is implemented, if you guys aren't familiar, is uh, in large part to avoid sort of cheating and rank whoring and all the other sort of uh, unmentionable behaviors that you get in, in uh, Halo. Uh, we, we put it on, on the web, so it's not always in people's face and it doesn't encourage bad behavior. I think that we, we understand that the community and the, especially the competitive side of the community really wants it. Uh, they sort of understand that it is a truism that there will be abuse of it. So I think that the, there are ways to solve for that and they're, they're technological, they're networking and uh, I think if you think about what the Xbox One is doing in the future in terms of cloud computing and lots of other stuff, I think that we'll end up with more tools to deal with that kind of thing and to, to give ourselves more tools and more flexibility to eliminate bad behavior online. So you can certainly be sure that we're thinking of ways to put uh, a, a, a more interesting way for people to understand their skill as well as their experience, for example, on the screen right in the game. And that's really about as much as I can say now because we're still obviously knee deep in development. So. Hi. Um, Hi. I just got a brand new kitten and named her Cortana. And yeah, because <laughs> I miss Cortana so much and I was wondering if we were going to be seeing Cortana anytime soon. Um, so if you haven't played to the end of Halo 4, cover your ears. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I would just say that quite apart from the fact that Cortana's story is hugely important to us as a franchise, I think also uh, the impact that she's had on the universe is something that we can explore as well because the, the Chief has obviously saved the galaxy. Uh, and is, is famous across the galaxy at this point, at least in our canon, but he didn't do it alone. And, uh, and I think that the legacy and the impact that Cortana had on the universe will continue to be felt for years to come. Hi. Um, I'm a big fan of Halo. Love the, love it. You guys are amazing at it. And I saw that there's the armor packs in the Champions DLC bundle. Now, since you guys are announcing that now with the Champions bundle, will, there, will we be seeing more armor packs at all for Halo 4? Graham? 
So the, the armors that are in there, I'm sure you've seen the split of what we have already. So um, to just talk a little bit about that. That was kind of like a collaboration between me and Frank. For you know, for Frank's pushing. He wants this forerunner armor, and he's hassling me, and he's hassling me, and we're like, yeah, okay, we'll do it. So made some kind of sacrifices to do that. Um, what's been announced at the minute is kind of the plan of record just now for what we're going to do. Uh, I don't think we have any other announcements past that for, for now, but that stuff's badass. Like I've been playing it all week. So uh, when they come out, I suggest getting them. And you, I think you'd be really happy with what you see. We also were able to uh, save uh, red versus blue uh, somewhat by adding the classic Mark V helmet. So you're going to hopefully see some changes from them in the future as well. How's it going, guys? Good to see you again. Um, so my question is, when you're developing the competitive aspect of Halo, just Halo 2, 3, 4, how do you keep things new and refreshing? and at the same time uh, cater to the casual and competitive side of the community? You know, that's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a multiplayer designer. In fact, I, I'm literally a bad player. That's not false modesty. But uh, I think that it, it's, it's a tension that exists throughout the entire franchise. When we went from Halo 1 to Halo 2, and we went from a LAN base to a, an online networking model and dual wielding, and then you go to Halo 3, which sort of re-simplified some of that, that combat sandbox again. Uh, and then you go, to, you go to Halo Reach, and there, and there are new things in there in terms of armor abilities. There, some things are just the sort of modernization of the shooter. I think that there's some things that people just come to expect. And um, as a Halo hardcore purist, I, I think that the entire multiplayer game should be like hang him high with pistols, right? But that's not, that's not really a great way to bring in new players and increase that population and make the whole ecosystem better for everyone. So it, it's a constant tension between trying to stay true to what's classic about Halo and, trying to, and tr also trying to bring it up to date so that you can make the game appealing to not just a dwindling set of players, which I think is the, the end game when you don't change and you don't evolve. Um, but I think that, that Halo has a feel to it that you, everyone in this room really understands. Like, there's some expectation of how the movement's going to feel and how your navigation through this world is going to feel. And I think uh, that's one of the things that, that you de definitely have to stay true to. But, uh, but ultimately, you, what you do is you bring in new ideas. And the best way to bring in new ideas is to bring in new people. And, and you know, we're a new studio. And we have a lot of Halo fans that are, that are some even more conservative than I am, and a lot, of, a lot of Halo fans who have new ideas and want to take it forward. So it's finding a balance between those two tensions, uh, between conservatism and, and uh, evolution, and, uh, and trying to find out what's right for the whole audience. Um, competitive players uh, definitely like a, a pared down subset of the game, and I think it's always going to be possible to give them something that, that they want, but it's the bigger picture. It's, you know, what, what's the game that's for everyone, and how, co how can we get as many people playing and, and having fun in that universe as possible? Thank you. Hi, I'm Pedro. Uh, Halo 3 and Halo Reach in the campaign mode had a theater mode. Uh, Halo 4, I realized it did not have yeah. that. I was wondering why I was not introduced in that, and uh, wondering if Halo 5 would bring that back. Um, so Xbox One uh, has a bunch of features that are, are going to be great for people who want to see video right off the bat. But we, we definitely understood that. And, and it goes back to my answer about the Forge question earlier. Um, it came down to time and resources and a delivery date that we had to hit and, and some things had to give. And I was really sad to see it go, as my colleagues know. Um, and uh, I think more importantly, seeing the, the reaction to that, we helped us get an even more solid understanding that this is something that we knew that people wanted it, uh, but we, you know, we, I think the game space has changed and more people are broadcasting and more people are showing their games and streaming. And uh, I think that the entire team fully understands that that's something that's uh, essential to multiplayer games, you know, from this point out. So you'll see us making more efforts in that regard. All right, thank you. Hello, sorry. Hello. A bit tall for me. You're the same height as me. <laughs> anyway, my favorite part of Halo is shooting things. What? So I was wondering if um, <laughs> I was wondering if, I, if you could let us know what's your favorite weapon and from which games. Like for example, I love Halo 3's battle rifle and sniper, yeah. and Halo 4's beam rifle. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, if I think about what my go most kills is probably right now in Halo 4, it'd be Battle Rifle, but the, the weapon I really enjoy using the most is the Plasma Pistol, because it's cheap, I'm good at it, it's easy, it, it doesn't just kill people, it ruins their, their momentary experience, because they're driving along and everything's great, they're drinking smoothies, and then their vehicle's stopped. And I, I don't really follow up with the coup de grace as often as I'd like, but it's just that, that you know, the schadenfreude of destroying their outing in their warthog. Uh, I would talk about stripping their shields and getting headshots, but I don't do that enough for that to be the, the part that gives me pleasure. Dan? Um, I'm a camper. Um, so I, I'm that guy that's ruining Frank's and your day and that you're cursing in the background. So I, I love me a good sniper rifle. I know, boo, clap, there's gonna be both in here, right? Come on, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's probably my, my favorite weapon in Spartan Souls, the SMG, and probably also in the entire series as well. I think for me this won't go down too well, but uh, I'm Mr. Bolt Pistol from Halo 4. I sit in the corner and I charge that up, and when you come around the corner, it's bang, bang, bye. It especially oh, works really scum. well in Regicide as well. Uh, scum. That's me, yeah. <laughs> I just I love the classic assault rifle. I love having the the readout um, of the you know the ammo that I have. Uh, it's just it, it's classic. It's fun. I'm actually a worse player than Frank, uh, as hard <laughs> as that is to believe. Uh, but if you look up my profile online, you will see that my most deaths have come from killing people with my fist. So. Wow. <laughs> and you still didn't do well in Evil last week, right? Like, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. I think we have time for a couple more questions. One more question we have time for, says the gentleman. Good. So thank you for the people behind the lady, but that this is going to be the last question. So make it good. Okay. Hi, Mr. O'Connor and distinguished <laughs> panel members. I first of all wanted to thank you for the gift of Halo. Um, it's made for a very happy marriage for my husband and I. He gets to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the typical story. <laughs> he gets to get his gaming game on, and I sincerely enjoy the artistry and the art and the world that is Halo, and also the music of Halo. And my question is, will you ever reveal the face of Master Chief? <sighs> Spoiler. <Say no>. Actually. <laughs> it's just Frank. No. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, we've, you know, the, fun, the funny thing about the Master Chief is, and I say this, I think, every other year at, at Comic-Con, is he's actually really, if you read Fall of Reach, he's quite explicitly described. He's very pale. And, and we, we did, uh, again, if you haven't finished on Legendary, close your ears. You do get a glimpse of his eyes uh, in, in the game. But he's, he's an interesting character because for a lot of people, he's a proxy for their adventures and their heroism in our universe. And for a lot of people, he's also a real character that they, they care about. So trying to figure out the balance between showing too much and uh, not showing enough is going to be a, a constant challenge for us. I think I think one day you you might see his face, but it would have to be it would have to be it's not nudity, but it would have to be important to the script, right? <laughs> but it would have to it would have to have some meaning for for us to to make a, a decision as as firm as that. And it you know it might be a hundred years from now, it might be a year from now, but I think one day. It'd be interesting to see what he looks like, and I. This is going to sound a little bit maudlin and a little bit serious, but I kind of want to see the effect that all this has had on his face, and see not so much what he looks like, but how his expression and how those years and all that combat is worn on him. So I'd like to see that. Cool. Thank you. So, thank you very much for joining us today. Again. A lot, of the, a lot of the extra excitement is going to happen over at the Hyatt, and then, you, again, you can get your lanyards if you have your card, and then head back over to the Comic-Con show floor and start collecting those pins. Uh, it was great having you guys. You're a lovely audience, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time, and thanks to the panel. Thank you.